organization day anyway. <clears throat> Although, okay, why don't I pass some of these around? Um, these are, I still do the old fashioned thing because I never have trusted the registrar for the last 37 years. Um, these are sign up sheets just so I know your email and, and department and your, your, and your name. Um, it has nothing to do with signing up for the course. You have to do that through the registrar. Um, but it just helps me know early on because the registrar doesn't give me a list until much later in the term. Although it's getting better. I used to have to wait till f fifth or sixth week of the term. I think I can get them within a lot quicker now. Uh, so you ready, Nicholas? Can you turn it on? Um, so my name's Tom Eager, and some of you have taken uh, a version of this before. I teach three courses during the year, 3370, 3371, and 3372. They're all something about structural materials. Um, and this semester, I'll be lecturing Dr. Belmar will be lecturing and Ms. Bonforth will be lecturing. Mike is a certified welding engineer, certified welding inspector. And my module, which Mike will be doing with me jointly, is welding metallurgy. And Simone is going to be talking about uses of structural materials and he'll talk a little bit about that uh, but it has to do with quality control and capacity of joints or not joints but of materials and whatnot um, the today is sort of an introduction uh, the course is actually taught in a series of modules and you have to take about 36 hours of lectures um, and this is a sheet from right off my website. If you go to the MIT website and put in my name, you'll find something called Eager Group. And on that, you'll see this list of 12 unit modules, by and large, that I have taught in previous years. And now the website actually lists uh, the year. So in summer of last summer, I taught fusion welding. Um, during the summer, I teach to the course 2N students, which are Navy students, Navy officers who are about around 30 years old, plus or minus a couple of years, and they come back to get a couple of master's degree at MIT um, before they go off and design ships for the Navy and things like that. So they have to have certain things according to the Naval Sea Systems Command for their curriculum at MIT, one of which is welding metallurgy, which was covered years ago by Professor Masabuchi. When he retired, I started covering it. And so you might find one or two lectures on welding metallurgy in this 12 units of fusion welding, but you probably won't. It might be in some of these others. But this semester, Mike and I decided we would try to put together a real fusion welding course. Um, but it is the metallurgy of welding. OK, great, thanks. It's the metallurgy of welding, so in a sense, you can think of it as it's a crash course in physical metallurgy of different materials. And what, what Mike and I will be doing in the welding metallurgy this semester, we'll do a number of lectures on, carbon st or on steels. Uh, then we'll do high alloys, which is stainless steels and nickel-based alloys. We'll do aluminum alloys. We'll do titanium alloys. We'll do... Uh, what else are we going to do? Um, uh, anyway, we can do any alloy you want. We can do iridium if you want. There is actually an application for welding of iridium about once every 25 years. Uh, they weld up a little iridium spheres uh, around plutonium, and when they have some space, NASA has a space shot that goes into deep space, like passing by Uranus or Neptune or Pluto. There's not enough sun light energy to power the spacecraft for 40 years, so they put a piece of plutonium in there, which generates heat, and they have thermoelectric generators, which are very reliable heat so or re reliable electrical sources, and they 
these things, the Voyager spacecraft that's been going for 30 or 40 years, it's powered by a piece of plutonium surrounded in iridium, uh, just in case it blows up when it's going up into orbit, rather than spreading plutonium all over the Atlantic Ocean, they just end up with one little iridium sphere, and they can go look for that, which has got plutonium in it. Don't tell anybody they're putting plutonium in spacecraft that could crash during the boost stage of the rocket because the environmentalists would get all upset, okay? But NASA doesn't advertise that anymore. But anyway, so there are applications of welding all kinds of structural materials. Fusion welding is something where I basically start out with flames, go through arcs, lasers, and electron beams, and talk about the process. And you go from 1,000 watts per square centimeter as a heat source up to a million watts per square centimeter. What are the different physical interactions that occur? So if someone wanted to take fusion welding, that's a 12-unit module. You basically have to get three full modules of 12 units. We will be teaching one and a half modules this semester live, and you're going to have to pick up some other modules on your own. Those of you who have taken the class before know that. Um, manufacturing and use of structural materials. Um, Dr. Belmar did that. That's, uh, it does focus on structural materials. You don't want to say anything more about the details of what you covered. How do we manufacture? Classes. Yeah, right. Yeah, my material selection is sort of a 100,000 foot view of how do you select materials economics. and get into the economics and externalities. And uh, Dr. Belmars is basically looking at okay, what type of properties can I get out of aluminum alloys or titanium alloys or steels? And how can I use those in design? Okay. Solid state welding is the first part of this, my total welding course. It's 12 units on adhesive bonding and brazing and soldering and diffusion bonding. Anything that's not melting metal um, to make a fusion weld, all those other welding processes, uh, explosive welding, cold welding, and stuff go in here. Um, codes and standards, that's on there twice because that was a new course that, that uh, talks about if I'm going out to manufacture something, I can't just go do anything I want. There are lots of rules and regulations out there in the world, okay? And the government tells me that uh, if I do this, some things by force of law, if I don't do it the way uh, the city of New York says or the federal government says in the Department of Transportation, I can't sell the product, okay? By the same token, some standards contain the historical knowledge of how to do things right and not have a big screw up. So historically, uh, some of our codes and standards have been written to correct for major mistakes. For example, the Northridge earthquake in Southern California 20 years ago or whatever, a lot of buildings and bridges came tumbling down or they were damaged to the tune of like $15 billion worth of Da uh, damage to these buildings. And a lot of the building codes were modified to allow for vi uh, earthquake vibrations. Now the Japanese have been doing that for 20 years because they have a lot more earthquakes than we do. But back in the 50s and 60s, we didn't design bridges and buildings in Southern California to accommodate those things. You still read in the news about how oh, they had an earthquake in Chile and you know, uh, or, or Iran and 10,000 people died. Uh, because the concrete buildings just collapsed on people, okay? We actually can design things because of different codes and standards. And I talk about kind of the politics of how codes and standards fit into both regulation of the government and in engineering and how it can um, be the corporate knowledge that teaches us how from the mistakes of the past, but it also can stifle innovation, okay? Uh, deformation processing, if you're w interested in forging or uh, sheet metal forming or wire drawing or any way to form ductile materials, um, then that course goes through the physics of forming and processing 
uh, using stamping presses and forging machines and wire drawers and things like that. Structural life assessment, uh, Dr. Belmar taught a module on that. You want to talk a little bit about that? We did cover fracture mechanics to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, it's basically fatigue and fracture, but from the point of view of a designer of what you have to consider as opposed to getting deep into the physics of the fracture, okay? Uh, there is this other course for on fracture uh, that the department that Dr. Belmar teaches part of on the physics of the fracture. Um, there's a casting course here, and I call it Intro to Materials Processing because this is where I take my shot at nanomaterials. Okay, it's only about a lecture, lecture and a half, about how nanomaterials will never be used for structural materials. They may be interesting for, for functional materials, but structural material nanomaterials are just going to be too expensive for most structural materials unless you're talking about spacecraft or something like that. If you're building a bridge across the Charles River you're not going to make it out of nanomaterials in spite of what all the researchers around tell you, okay? Haven't had that discussion with the department head since last Thursday, okay? Where I was, we had a faculty meeting off-site and I made some comment about nanomaterials and he started telling me how wonderful they were. I thought, okay. Um, so we have a difference of opinion. Solid state welding is the old version three years before. I kind of try to renew these every three years. So there's the old version of that. Material selection, fracture, NDT, and welding metallurgy. Uh, you're getting the welding metallurgy. This is where I had three or four lectures. NDE, I may teach a course on that this summer to the Navy guys. I used to teach some uh, fracture mechanics, uh, but that's sort of been supplanted. So this was years ago. Material selection has been supplanted by one that's not on here, which is the one I did last fall on introduction to our material selection and this is the 100,000 foot view. Fusion welding is the old version of this one up here. Uh, this solid state welding, um, I've been videotaping these for over 20 years now and how an old one got in here, I don't know, but anyway, it's on there. And then there are some other archived ones that are just a selection of some of these from even older times. Um, some of you, like Christine, which ones, did, what were modules did you take last time? Okay, so you can tell people about what, what that is, okay? You also took my intro, my live course, and you probably took Dr. Belmar's course, okay? So you took 24 units live and 12 units by video, okay? Uh, uh, Jonathan, what did you take last time? Okay, as well as the 24 units of, of live stuff. And anyway, you're welcome to take whatever you want, but you can't take something you took last time. Okay, that sort of makes sense, right? Um, so, does anybody have any questions on, on that? You have to take 36, approximately 36 lectures, because that's what you get in a 12 unit course at MIT. Now, some of you know that I schedule this uh, quite a bit differently than the regular MIT course. Uh, we meet every day of the week that's a scheduled class day, 9 to 10 in this room. And if everything was, goes perfectly, we would be finished by the end of February with the lectures. Okay, how about that? And then uh, we actually probably won't finish until early March because I've got to be out of town on Friday. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Belmar is lecturing on Friday. But anyway, I'm lecturing today and tomorrow. Dr. Belmar, Dr. Belmar, I'm lecturing on the 10th. I'll give you the schedule uh, a little bit more detail tomorrow when we know it a little bit better. Uh, Mike Bonforth is doing the 12th and 13th of next week. I'm doing the 14th. Come here for Valentine's Day. Um, whatever. Um, so we do the lectures. It's front loaded. You get things to read. Um, you don't have to read them, but uh, you can read them. If you read the course evaluations from prior years, 
Um, one student says you can get a lot or a little out of the course depending on how much you want to do outside of class. What are you required to do out of class? What's the assignment? Um, if you really want to do a term paper, and it would be a 10-page term paper, you can. Okay, you, if you don't want to do a term paper, uh, the preferred method, most students do a presentation in class, and this will probably come right after spring break, beginning of April. We'll schedule it, and we'll do two or three lectures uh, of your presentations a day. Those, who, those of you who did it last term, you get to come up with another topic. You can't give the same presentation you gave last term. Okay, uh, or if you really couldn't do either one of these, uh, you can talk to me. I do have an old homework set on the old welding stuff of 10 problems, and you can do the 10 problems. You only have to do one of these, okay? In fact, uh, those of you that have been in this class before know that I give a, a little lecture at the beginning of how I have a bad attitude about the way we do education that students both in high schools and in colleges are just prepped to take quizzes. And um, I don't think that's a very good learning environment. Um, uh, I started realizing this 20 some years ago. I, one of my kids left their high school math book on the kitchen table and I was sitting there eating breakfast, kind of flipping through. It had two pages on every mathematical topic you can think of. Matrices, you know, exponentials, logarithms, d differentials, integration. So everything in math could be taught in two pages by definition in this high school book. And all it was is I look at it and say, well, this is just coaching you to take answer some of the questions on the SAT exam, right? Okay. And in fact, that's to a certain extent what happens at MIT. Um, what do we get at MIT? We get some of the brightest students in the world who have proven that you know how to take quizzes. Okay, you couldn't have gotten here if you didn't know how to take quizzes. And so you, what you like to do, not you like to do, many MIT students like to compete with their peers by showing that they can get good grades on a quiz. You take my course and you're out of luck. Okay, there's no quizzes. There's no final exams. You can't show how much smarter than you are you are than your your classmates, um, but hopefully you can just enjoy learning. So actually, you don't have to take a copy of this if you were in the class last term, but I hand out this article I wrote for the faculty newsletter on education at MIT. Um, you can, it's the same one I handed out. I hand out in all my classes to kind of tell you about my good or bad attitude about uh, about uh, education and how it how it goes i was very pleased for years that no one had to take my course it wasn't required for anyone and if you want to take the course we're here to try to learn about different things and maybe i'll talk about some of those things in a little bit um, so that's the assignment i'm supposed to tell you therefore there is no possibility of cheating in this class so I don't have to tell you about cheating, right? You shouldn't cheat, okay? Uh, but I don't know how you would cheat in a class like this, okay? You're gonna you're gonna download some presentation off the internet and try to give it, okay? Well, anyway, uh, I I don't care, okay? I mean, you're the one who's paying big tuition to try to get around the system. Um, so I think that's all that I had. Sign up, schedule assignments, um, and the different modules. Anybody have any questions on overviews? Yes. Yep. You have to have them done before I have to turn the grades in in May. Yeah, you can start watching them now. You can start watching them on May 10th and cram them in at the end. That's another another one of my philosophies. <laughs> Students will come to me and say, "What do I have to do?" I, or you know, give me a give me a deadline. I mean, I'm not saying you, but I've had my own doctoral students have to write up their thesis, and one of them said, "Well, give me a deadline." I said, "No." 
He says, well, I, need, I work better under deadlines. I said, fine, set one for yourself. My job is to train students on how to be professionals. And a professional does not need someone else to give them a deadline. So you're a professional here. You get a schedule when you do these things. One student on an evaluation said that they watched them while they were fixing dinner at home. OK? So in the background, they got me. I mean, I put on a Celtics game while I'm working at home, right? Fine. It's in the background. If there's a, a play, there's always going to be a replay, and I can look up. OK, so if you're fixing dinner, and all of a sudden you hear a story you want to hear, you can let the carrots burn while you listen to my story, OK? I don't care when you do it, OK? In fact, one of the problems, if I get involved in MITx or EDx and stuff, I'm probably going to have to have some way to ensure that the students actually watch the videos. Those of you that took the thing last term will know I don't even check up on you, OK? I do expect if you're going to, well, let me back up. If you didn't want to listen to the live lectures, you could take 36 lectures all by video. And that's one of the, to me, the beauties of this. If we videotape the lectures, anybody in the world can take this course. But only you can get credit because you paid the tuition, right? But I've been putting my course on the, online for 15 years now before MITx and EDx. And I know that there are professors at other universities. When they have to go out of town, they pull off one of my lectures and show it to the students while they're gone, OK? Because it's just Tom Eager and stories, right? And so it's kind of like having a guest lecturer, right? And someone tells a story, OK? So if you're here, to, from my point of view, you're here to learn. And one of the things I am trying to do is help you draw analogies. There are some, some people who just spend all their time lecturing, OK, and telling you. It's kind of like uh, Moses coming down from the mountain and giving you the Ten Commandments. So this is the Ten Commandments of engineering, and you should learn this, right? Well, I believe in kind of a different philosophy. I would much rather convince you that you already know the answer to many things. You just never had someone p tell you how to put it together. OK, so when I'm talking fusion welding and I have to talk about arcs, one of my favorite lectures is what I call the, the fluorescent light lecture, where I tell you the difference between a high pressure arc, which is a welding arc at one atmosphere pressure. And that's what the physicists call it. One atmosphere is high pressure to a physicist. OK, or a fluorescent light, which you know is at a lower pressure. You ever broken a fluorescent light and it implodes and you hear it go pop, right? It implodes because it's like, I don't know, a fifth of an atmosphere. And it's a glow discharge. And we have fluorescent lights in this room. But fluorescent lights are cooler, right, than an incandescent light. But LEDs are even cooler. And what's the physics of giving off light? And what does that have to do with welding? Zippo, OK? Unless you're using light to weld, and some people do. They use very intense light sources as a heat source to weld plastics and things. Some people have even welded some metals using very intense light sources. But nonetheless, you need to understand the basic physics of how plasmas cause heating or non-heating. And it turns out a fluorescent light is a two-temperature plasma. The electrons have a temperature of 100,000 degrees, and the ions have a temperature of 100 degrees C. OK? That's why you can put your hand on a fluorescent light, because the ions, what you feel is the ion temperature. You can't feel the electron temperature, but you can see it. It's the electrons that give you light. Same thing in an LED. It's the changing of the direction of the electrons that causes them to radiate and give off light. In that case, you don't even have to heat up ions. So LEDs are more energy efficient than fluorescent lights. So what I'd get to do by teaching you welding is teach you about all kinds of little physical things that I've learned over the years. And you actually learned most of this in freshman physics. But no one ever told you how it fit together. Because they, who was teaching you? A physicist. They haven't a clue of how it fits together. Okay. And in fact, I was a student here. And I look back and think, how come they never told me about these things? You know, I learned in thermodynamics, I learned how to calculate a heat engine up one side and down the other, but I couldn't tell you how an air conditioner worked. 
Did you know an air conditioner is a heat engine? No one ever told me that. I had to figure, I had to learn that in the gutter of going out in the real world. Okay? But an air conditioner is a heat engine. So what I'm one of the things I'm trying to help you do is learn that all these things you learned when you got the MIT science education is actually a useful piece of knowledge if someone actually shows you how to use it. Okay? And if you if you learn how to use it in a few examples, I bet you can figure out how to use it in other examples and be creative in your own way. Okay? So it's a different philosophy than Moses coming down from the mountain saying, here are the Ten Commandments of welding. Okay? It's more, well, did you know that fluorescent lights are just a different type of arc? Okay? Or my um, adhesive bonding lecture in solid state welding, someone asked me to give you some examples. I call it the Scotch tape lecture. Okay. Why does Scotch tape, if you put it on the wall, why does it later fall off if it's holding something on the wall? Whereas duct tape holds things much better and much longer. But if you put Scotch tape on and it falls off the wall, why do you go over and then push it on even harder, hoping that it will stick longer? Well, it just turns out to be a viscous flow equation. Okay. And if you learn about the viscous flow equation, you'll understand why duct tape works better than scotch tape. And dirty scotch tape doesn't work as well and doesn't last as long and things, OK? And you also learn about all kinds of adhesives, right? OK? Jordan's learning about adhesives. She's doing a bachelor's thesis on adhesives, OK? So she's actually watched that lecture, right? Uh, and these, these equations have been around for, for years. It's just no one ever teaches them to you in context. Uh, so I kind of consider these context subjects. Um, what other, what, any other questions? Simone, do you want to give an example of some of yours? Yeah, I'll give a few examples. Okay. You can jump into I will. You know me. <laughs> oh, yeah.